Father, again, we give you thanks for this opportunity to draw nearer to you through your word, through worship. Ask that you would continue to have your way in us and through us, O Lord. Even now, in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Good morning, good morning again. Please um, turn in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 16. Matthew chapter 16, as we continue our chapter by chapter, verse by verse study in the Gospel of Matthew. A couple of verses today that we're going to deal with, a lot of information, if you will. I remind you that as we dig in, um, my prayer for you and your prayer for you should also be, should be, Lord, show me that which you have for me today. Um, There's only so much that I can share, if you will, from here, from the pulpit, in the sense that um, God needs to show you, specifically and personally, that which He has for you um, through the Scriptures. So, prayfully, you have your Bibles there, Matthew chapter 16, and by the way, we do have a quick announcement after service. So, prayfully, you have your Bibles there. And uh, I remind you that up to now, Jesus has been dealing, or at least at the beginning of Matthew 16, he's been dealing with the multitudes. He's been dealing with the? So he's dealing with everybody. His disciples are included. The apostles are included, right? Because the apostles are disciples, but not all disciples are apostles. So you have this group of people. He's specifically addressing more, uh, you know, throughout Matthew 16, the Pharisees and Sadducees, these religious leaders, um, Dealing with them and, their, and, the el- and the tradition of the elders. So he's been dealing with all of that. And now he takes a moment, if you will. Well, not a moment, but he takes a, an opportunity. And he shifts his, uh, his attention to specifically his own, the apostles. And um, you have your Bibles there. Well, look at Matthew chapter 16. Let, let us start with verse 13. And so when Jesus came into the region of Caesarea Philippi, Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, saying, Who do men say that I am? The Son. Who do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? So they said, verse 14, Some say John the Baptist, some Elijah, others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. He said to them, verse 15, Matthew 16, but who, do you, but, who do you say, but who do you say that I am? Simon Peter answered and said, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Jesus answered and said to him, Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. And I also say to you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. And I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Then he commanded his disciples that they should tell no one that he was Jesus the Christ, the Messiah. And so I want to draw your attention to verse 13 again. And when Jesus came into the region of Caesarea Philippi, Caesarea Philippi, and real quickly, on a side note, that which I told you from the beginning, which was that he, we see, though he's dealing with the multitudes for a good portion of Matthew 16, his attention, if you will, shifts specifically to the disciples and even more specific, to the apostles. And this area of um, Caesarea Philippi, Josephus, um, the writer, this guy named Josephus, I've mentioned that to you before. Um, and, And real quickly right now, let me say this to you. At this point in my Christian walk, I don't encourage anybody to go read anything. Can you go read Josephus? Absolutely. Nothing wrong with that. Um, But I submit to you, you know what? Spend your time reading (laughs) Genesis through Revelation. And even more specifically, Romans through Philemon. 
I would encourage you to do that. You know and that in this day and age, we're very limited with time, right? Because, you know, all the sports are on. <laughs> Let's call it what it is. It's not like if any, of, any one of us here has three jobs. You might. I don't know. Um, I know one of the brothers works like many hours, as him and I have shared. With, he talked about that before. But our time is limited. And, and so my exhortation to you is, listen, there's some really good people out there. But you know who the best people are? Right here. Peter and Paul and John and Matthew and um, James um, and whoever wrote Hebrews. Those are the good guys that you want to be reading. And those are the guys that you want to take your time reading based on the fact that your time is so limited. Say amen if you're with me. So, um, you know, I've shifted all my attention to, to just, man, this. You know, and again, so this guy, Josephus, he tells us that um, th this, this area here, um, and we know this area, it, it is a, a very secluded area, if you will, and it's a very cool area, as in weather-wise. Say amen if you're with me, right? So we see Jesus coming from, from the Dead Sea up to this area where it's very cool. And as a matter of fact, this is where we find the headwaters, if you will, where the Jordan River literally physically starts. And, I, and it's possible that we've discussed this before briefly, but so here's the, the, the Jordan River, and it starts there in um, Caesarea Philippi, and it shifts into, and, and, and it's the vein, if you will, the, 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 the main uh, source of water for all of Israel. And it shifts all the way down. And it keeps going. And, and so it's interesting to me that Jesus would take his disciples, his apostles specifically, when he brings them away from the crowd. He's going to deal with them specifically and personally now. And he takes them away and he takes them to this area. Uh, much like a refreshing, if you will. They were in the heat, lacking food, you remember? <laughs> and now he brings them up here to this cool place of refreshing and, um, and this is where it's all going to start with them specifically and personally. Because here we're going to start. Um, we're about two and a half years into the ministry. He started at age 30. Those of you that are here on Wednesday nights, you were reminded why he was able to start at age 30. Because he was a priest. Amen. Specifically going to be a high priest. Well, he is a high priest. He's just going to walk into that. Um, Numbers chapter 4 tells us that a priest um, can only start, for, he can be from age 30 to age 50. Say amen if you're with me. And so here we are, and uh, two and a half years in, give or take, and, and, and this is where it's going to start, and this is where it's going to get heavy, and this is where it's going to be dealing with them personally and, and physically. And so he shifts his attention to them, to them, because, because now the, the, the on, uh, what do you call it when you, your hands are on it, the... Um, Nobody is helping me? Okay. Um, this, this is where the training is going to get even more specific, if you will. Say amen if you're with me, right? Because they're going to be called to go speak of the Messiah. But they need to learn about the Messiah. See, because it wasn't just the miracles. It wasn't just the rebuke of these religious leaders guiding people uh, towards God in an inappropriate manner with profane fire, if you will in an unholy manner with the tradition of the elders. No, there was one way and one way only to God. And not only that, it wasn't just the, the this Messiah wasn't just about miracles and healings. He was the suffering servant. And so they're getting prepared to go out because these men, these 12 specifically, minus one, right? They're going to go out and shape, if you will, by the power of the Spirit, the church. This new nation, if you will. Not a Gentile nation and not a Jewish nation, but a nation made of the two. Jew and Gentile. Again, those of you that are here, were here on Wednesday night, you know exactly what I'm talking about. We touched on that briefly. And so this is what's happening. So these guys are getting um, hands-on, which is, that's what I was looking for, the hands-on, um, teaching, if you will, and it starts. Amen? Got your Bibles there? So notice, he takes them into this region of Caesarea Philippi, and he asked his disciples, 
which included the apostles, and specifically the apostles, saying, Who do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? And you know, and I know, that this was his favorite term for himself. Jesus was the Son of Man. True or false? We've discussed that on various occasions. Um, We see that first spoken about in Daniel. And we see this spoken of also in Ezekiel when God calls Ezekiel son of man. But specifically the term is for him. He uses that for himself. So I want you to look up here. Very academic setting today. A lot of information. Son of man? Question mark? Yes. You know and I know. He was the son of God who emptied himself. Philippians chapter 2 verses 5 through 11 tells us that very clearly. And was now a man made of woman. 1 Timothy chapter 2 verse 5 tells us, For there is one God and one mediator between God and men. The angel, Christ Jesus? No. Thank you for the one we're looking. No. The, um, no, the man, Christ Jesus. See, we've gone over this before, but it's worth speaking of again. It was man who thwarted God's plan by free will. And therefore, it could only be man to redeem man. But of course, not man uh, of our DNA. No, it was by the seed of the Holy Spirit. It was this one, capital O, born not of man, but of the Holy Spirit, through woman. And so again, Son of Man, yes, in fact, He was the Son of God, but who emptied Himself, as Philippians chapter 2 tells us, and now, and was now a man made of woman. And again, 1 Timothy 2, 5, For there is one God and one mediator between God and man, and men, and that's the man, Christ Jesus. And so this is why he calls himself the Son of Man. Because in fact he came from a woman. Not of the seed of a man, but of the seed of the Holy Spirit. Not with the affliction, if you will, not with the infection, if you will, of that malady that we've all been born with. Iniquity, transgression, sin. And so, that in and of itself, listen, reminder, doesn't qualify him. No, he still needed to live his life and fulfill the law and henceforth be sinless to be able to die for your sin and my sin. For a sinful man cannot pay the price for another sinful man because it's like, what is that? That doesn't make sense. No, he who knew no sin, that's the only one that can do that. He became sin. So that now you and I can receive that righteousness that God has offered to us. Amen? So it couldn't be an angel. It couldn't be a goat. That was just a a shadow of that which was to come. For the Bible tells us very clearly that until the fullness of the time, And here we are in the midst of that fullness of the time. It was about to be um, consecrated, if you will. It was about to be ratified, if you will. With his death, burial, and listen, resurrection. You can't just have his death. You can't just have his burial. You've got to have his death, burial, and resurrection. Therein is the completion, if you will. And therein is where you and I can now step into forgiveness. Not sinlessness, forgiveness. Sinlessness, of course, positionally, but not practically. That day will come one day. So again, Son of Man, and this is why He's the Son of Man. So notice, chapter 16, verse 13. So when Jesus came into the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, saying, Who do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? 
And so they, notice they, who? Tell me again, who? So in, in, in a way that we don't know, they're all speaking and one saying one thing and the one saying is the other thing. Now we're going to see, to see Peter become the spokesman in just a couple of minutes. Um, but they're all speaking and he has them there all together. And so Peter becomes the spokesman as he often does. So notice, so who do men say that I am? And so they said, well, some say John the Baptist and some Elijah. And others, Jeremiah or one of the prophets. J the B, the reformer. Uh, Elijah, the miracle worker. Uh, Jeremiah, the prophet. And so all good guys, I would presume. Uh, all men that are um, revered by, by the Jewish culture. Um, but all dead. <laughs> Newsflash. Did you notice? They're all what? Dead. <laughs> and I'll let you figure out... Um, why these particular guys were mentioned. Good homework assignment, I guess, but even a better homework assignment, read Romans through Philemon because that's even more important. But you certainly can dig in a little more and, and figure that out. Uh, I don't think I want to really spend any time with that because, again, it does nothing for you and I and the battle that I'm going to have tomorrow, right? Because you know you're going to have a battle tomorrow, right? Yeah, because you got to get up and you got to deal with people. And, and, and the first per person you're going to be dealing with is the one that you look in the mirror, right? Because, you know, that can be a struggle as well because we're all f just complex beings and we're all with, with some issues and we all have some scars in our hearts and we all have some, and you know how that is. So, but, but again, I'll challenge you. Hey, man, if you want to dig in, why the, the culture thought it would be Elijah, why they thought it would be John the Baptist, why they thought it might be Jeremiah, man, look it up if you want. But don't let that take your time up when it comes to Romans through Philemon. Right? And so notice, well, so they tell them, you know, they speak of all these dead guys, right? I don't know, is this a ghost? I mean, is re reincarnation? I don't know. But so they said, some say John the Baptist, some Elijah, others Jeremiah or one of the prophets. And then he asked them a very important question. Because again, remember, they are being prepared. Amen? They're being prepared for that call that they have on their lives, for that election that God has chosen beforehand to put these men through. Now remember, there's 12 right now, but one is going to be um, removed. So there's only going to be 11, and there's going to be one put in that man's place. So notice, but he said to them, but who do you say that I am? Verse 16, and Simon Peter answered, again, he's apparently the spokesman, at least right now he is. And Simon Peter answered and said, you are the Christ, the Son of of the living God. Verse 17, And Jesus answered and said to him, Well, blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. Your attention, please, if you can look up here. And so notice, he looks at Peter and he says, Hey, uh, blessed are you, Simon Barjona couple things that I want us to look into uh, that pertain to us as well. So Peter, I submit to you, was blessed because of what he believed. And what did he believe? Well, he proclaimed it, did he not? What did he say? You are the Christ. You're the Son of God. So we know what he believed. Peter was blessed because of what he believed, and listen, and because of who it came from. For that information didn't come from Matthew. It didn't come from Bartholomew. It didn't come from um, James. It came from God himself. So Peter, in fact, was blessed because of what he believed and because of who it came from. And now as we dig in a little bit deeper and, and we put ourselves into that, I submit to you that, listen, true believers are truly blessed. And I don't know if you've thought about that today or not. It seems, at least in my life, <laughs> I often forget how much God loves me and how truly blessed I am. I don't know if, that, if you ever struggle with that, and you probably don't because you probably never even think about it. 
But I have noticed in my life that my tendency, and as I deal with people, their tendency is always to focus in on the negative. Thank you. To always focus on the negative. That's me at times, by the way. But I want to remind you that true believers, and I'm not sure if you can even put true believers because you're either a believer or you're not, right? That little true there is a little bit hyperbolic, if you will. It's a little bit of, a, of a, an exaggeration because if you're a believer, then I don't need to put true, right? Because you're a believer. But I just wanted to add some like pop to it, if you will. And it went, and it went well with the truly blessed. <laughs> true believers, they're truly blessed. And one of the things that I have been growing in Still progressing, right? I'm at the elementary level right now. I want to get to the doctorate, right? But I'm at the elementary level right now. But thank God I'm at the elementary level because two years ago, I didn't even know. Man, I am so truly blessed. And even though there might be some negative here and there, which is very real, by the way, right? We don't want to discard it. It's valid, right? Man, the the truly blessed part, if you will, so much overrides the little bit of negative that might exist. Same and if you're with me, family. And so I think that's so important because oftentimes I see it in believers. Their lives, it lacks some joy. It lacks some quote-unquote quote unquote, unquote strength. La puerta. It lacks some strength. Why? Because the focus is always, what? Woe is me. Woe is me. Woe is me. This isn't happening. That isn't happening. And you take a step back and you're like, dude, you're like a billionaire. <laughs> you like have everything. <laughs> what are you talking about? And by the way, just because you don't have it right now, doesn't mean you won't have it in a week. Just because you don't have it right now, doesn't mean you're not going to have it in two weeks. Just because you don't have it right now doesn't mean you won't have it in a year. Because God is preparing, don't you know? Even as He's preparing these men right now. Notice they're men, by the way. Notice He's preparing these men right now. They weren't ready yet to go out and to proclaim that this is the Messiah. They weren't ready yet because they didn't know the totality of Him, about Him. They just thought He's the miracle worker. He's, they just thought he's the one that, that can make the blind see. They didn't know about the spiritual aspect of it, that indeed the spiritually blind were going to see. They thought it was all physical. Oh, they were learning, but they weren't ready yet. And so I submit to you that there's a preparation for everything in our lives. And sometimes the preparation, listen, is sometimes just humbling ourselves. We lack that humility. We haven't gotten to that point to say, Lord, even if the fig tree doesn't blossom, I'm still going to follow you. Even if this doesn't go my way, I'm still going to follow you, Lord. And so I remind you that true believers, listen, they're truly blessed. You know what's going to happen to this guy, Peter? Well, you know. He's going to be crucified. And he's going to be crucified upside down. And, biblical, and, and, and legend tells us with another book that I'm not even going to mention because I don't want you to go read it. <laughs> I want you to read Romans through Philemon. That's what I want you spending your time on. If you want to stick in a James, if you want to stick in a First Peter like some of our family is, another young lady here is in First John, do it. Absolutely. That's what I want you to focus in on. But another book tells us that they brought Peter's wife in front of him to torture her so that he would deny Christ. And his response was, remember the Lord. He tells his wife, remember the Lord because he was, she was about to get, they were going to bring her right in front of her to torture her in front of him so that he would deny Christ. My point is that Jesus looks at him knowing full well what's going to happen and says, you're truly blessed, kid. 
you are blessed, man, because of, your, because of your proclamation, that proclamation that you just made, that which you believe, you're truly blessed, and you're truly blessed because of who it came from. And so I remind you here today, as I remind myself, I'm trying to grow in this. True believers, they're truly blessed. And it's a good thing to wake up. I've started practicing that when I remember. Seven days out of the, out of the week, I'm remembering only twice. But maybe next week it's going to be three times. Amen? And maybe the week after it's going to be five times. And I'm remembering to recount some of the blessings. Lord, thank you for today, Lord. Thank you that, man, the bills are paid, Lord. Thank you, Father, that I'm going to have meals today. You know? Because whenever I feel like eating, guess what? I eat. <laughs> you know, not everybody has that. You know that, right? Whenever I feel like eating, I eat. I come here and I look, man, and there's like a spread out there which by the way you're welcome i buy that for you every weekend right there's this huge spread out there man i look around man i see people that i love and you're all healthy you know that if you were sick guess what that makes me sick man you guys are healthy you're strong um this morning i was talking to to one of the sisters hey did your son tell you that we missed you and we loved you yes and i'm getting past it she said that brings in tremendous joy to my heart. And so, man, we're truly, truly blessed. We're truly blessed. Even though maybe not the totality of it all hasn't come to fruition, number one, listen, it doesn't mean it's not going to. And number two, man, we're truly blessed today. And so I remind you of that. If anything, listen, your sins have been done away with. Your sins, as far as the east is from the west, your sins have been thrown into the sea of forgetfulness. Psalm 103 tells us, you have traded in your sins for His righteousness. And the day is coming when that atonement, which means that you are going to get your new body, Romans 8.23, that's what the atonement is. We're going to get that. And we're going to be allowed to be in the presence of God forever and ever. Forever and ever. Free of sin. Glorified. Done. No more sin is going to have any place in our lives. And we're going to be able to become that individual that God had planned from day one. Before you were formed, He knew you. And it's as simple as that. And so I remind you of that as I remind myself. And listen, let me challenge you. Let me exhort you. Don't forget to text me that this week. Because you know, this dummy forgets. And I'll start getting on my little trips of what isn't going right. And so I need a reminder just like you need a reminder. So why don't you remind yourself to remind me. I'm serious. I'm not even playing with that. You send me a text. Hey, true believers are truly blessed. Look at Psalm 89, verse 15 and 16. By the way, let me give you another a homework assignment, if you will. Don't go read any goofy books or any strong books. Read the Bible. Psalm 89, 1 through 16 is an absolute knockout. But an absolute knockout but I just wanted to touch on verse 15 and 16 specifically. Listen to what it says. Blessed are the people who know the joyful sound. They walk, O Lord, in the light of your countenance. In your name, notice, they, rejo they rejoice how long? All day long. And in your righteousness, they are exalted. Men, if you just, just that... You just read that throughout the day and I'm telling you that your spirit is going to explode. True believers, listen, truly blessed. And that's you and I today. So don't forget that. Matter of fact, why don't you turn some, to somebody, tell them you're truly blessed. You're truly blessed, bro. Yes, I am. Thank you. Truly blessed, Christy. Truly blessed, Flo Surreal. Truly blessed, Ferns. Truly blessed. And hey, those of you that have heard it, receive it. Amen? Amen? Receive it because, man, we're truly, truly blessed. This morning I was goofing around with one of the brothers. He got a brand new car. 
I don't mean to embarrass him, but who cares? <laughs> Truly blessed. And I know we tend to look at the material, and we do because we're so materialistic. And that's okay, man. We're in this world. We're here. You know, we, we're, we're able to work. Man, give the Lord, you know, His first fruits. Pay your creditors. And then, man, party, baby. Right? You know, I always tell you what to do with your money, right? Those of you that have taken that formula, this is why you got money. Those of you that haven't followed that formula, this is why you're always begging for $2. I'm sorry, but that's the truth of the matter. There's a real simple formula. And if I were to call up all the people that follow that formula, they would say, it works. It hurt at first to give that check because what do you mean $50 to the Lord? What do you mean $200 to the Lord? What do you mean $1,000 to the Lord? Oh my gosh. You know, you, you kind of get stiff on that one, don't you? You know. You know. But man, once you start seeing that he's a debtor to no man, and that you can never outgive him. And all of a sudden, it starts coming from everywhere. And all of a sudden, you get the promotion. And all of a sudden, you get the raise. And all of a sudden, you find the $40 on the floor. And all of a sudden, you're like, oh my gosh, this is like real. It works. So again, we tend to look at the materialistic. But, but, but you know, and that's part of our lives. We're, let's not hide and act like so we're so holy that no, you know. Uh, I can afford a two-bedroom, but I'm going to live in an efficiency. And nothing wrong with living in efficiency, by the way. But let's not play games, you know. We, we like what we like. Hence the new car. <laughs> Praise the Lord, bro. I hope you prayed for it, yes? Because, the Lord, you know, we want to honor the Lord with, all our, uh, um, with, our, with what He's given us. Amen? And that's what we always do. We, every time we get a new car, we pray for it. We pray over it. Lord, never, never let us use this to dishonor you in any way, Lord. Bless it, Lord. You, you know, He's got a plan and a purpose and all of that. And so again, we, we tend to look at the material, but there's so much more, you know. Man, blessed are the people who know the joyful sound. They walk, O oh Lord, in the light of your countenance. In your name they rejoice all day long. Why? Because in your righteousness we're exalted. You can put your name there. Blessed are, blessed is Edward Abraham who knows the joyful sound. I walk, O oh Lord, in the light of your countenance. In your name, Harry rejoices all day long. And in your righteousness, Christy is exalted. Put your name there. Because that's you and that's me. So truly blessed. Our true believers are truly blessed. And he tells them so. Simon Peter answered and said, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Verse 17, Jesus answered and said to him, Blessed are you, Simon Barjona. For flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. Again, speaking to Him specifically, don't want to reach too much, but it includes us. Because you and I have also made that proclamation. Amen? Truly, Lord, you are the Son of God. Truly, Lord, you are the Messiah. Truly, Lord, you are the Savior. Truly, Lord, you are the one who has allowed me to trade in my sin for your righteousness. Truly, Lord, you're the one that has forgiven me. Your blood has allowed my forgiveness. How convenient that you walked away when we were speaking about money. She didn't notice. Let's move on. So, blessed are we. Notice, verse 18. And I also say to you that you are Peter. Pebble in translation. And on this rock, I will build my church and the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. So let's camp out right here for a couple of minutes and let's discuss this for a second. So notice he tells Peter, hey, little rock, because that's what he means, pebble. And then he says to him, hey, little rock, on this rock I am going to build, notice, my church. First time that this word church is mentioned here in the New Testament. And the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. So let's discuss this. So I think it's pretty clear, but we, let's, let's kind of go from all angles or from a couple of angles, lest there be any confusion. And we prepare ourselves and we, um, and we equip ourselves to 1 Peter 3.15 to give a defense for that hope that is in us. Say amen if you're with me, right? Again, you know that's always our... our 
our angle, if you will, that, that we would know the Bible, that we would embrace the Bible, that, 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 that I, I wouldn't draw from this, that this year in 2025, you're going to get your miracle. I don't know if that's the case or not. It might be. I believe it is for some of us, but inconsequential. That's not what this is talking about. It's talking about something completely different, so that's what we wanted to embrace. So let's, let's, let's land here and, and, and kind of break this down a little bit so that, again, we would understand the totality of it. If we can look up here. So notice, he says, I'm going to build what? My church. Right? So, again, we're going we're gonna to continue to deal with this. But let's start with that Christ is the builder of his church. He's not the builder of our church. He's the builder of his church. Zechariah chapter 6, verse 11 through 13, gives us a glimpse of this many years before. It says, Behold the man whose name is the branch. From his place, he shall branch out, and he shall build the temple of the Lord. By the way, if you're curious about where the temple of the Lord is, look around. It's the guy sitting next to you. It's the girl sitting next to you. Individually and collectively. And he shall build the temple of the Lord because he's going to branch out, right? What's his name? The branch. Yes, verse 13, he shall build the temple of the Lord and he shall bear the glory and shall sit and rule on his throne. So he shall be a priest on his throne and the council of peace shall be between them both. Your attention please. Again, we touched on we touched on it. We touched it. We touched on it on Wednesday briefly. In fact, Jesus was going to be the high priest. Um, Hebrews chapter 3 verse 1 tells us that he's the high priest. But not after the order of Aaron, after the order of Melchizedek. Say amen if you're with me, as the book of Hebrews tells us. That's why he had to start at, at age 30. That's why Exodus chapter 29 tells us that a priest um, ratified the priest. So John the Baptist ratified him and that priest needed to be washed. And in fact, that's why he was water baptized. Say amen if you're with me. Fulfill it to be so, uh, permit it to be so, he said. So that we would fulfill all righteousness. And in fact, and there's much more there, but we're just touching on it, you know, on the surface. Again, there, there's, there's, we can get a lot deeper, but we're not because that's not the point of today or even on Wednesday. And so here, I remind you that Christ is the builder of the church. You're part of the church. I'm part of the church. I am the church individually. You are the church individually. We are the church collectively. He's building a group of people that he calls the church. Next one, please. So notice the church. Ecclesia in the Greek. Well, ancient Greek, it's the ancient Greek word for group. Or group called out. No religious, no religious terminology there. It's funny that he would use that word and it would have no religious connotations. This word, Ecclesia. And, and, I, and I think it's important because the Jews or the religious leaders, they were all about the religion. True or false? Abs exactly. And he wasn't about religion. He was about relationship. The shift was happening. It has always been about relationship. But God used religion, if you will, to, to lead and to guide to relationship. Now it's the Holy Spirit. But again, the church, ecclesia, the ancient Greek word for group or group called out. Again, zero religious connotations. Nothing religious about that word. So I love that he used that. Only he can figure that one out. Only he could come up with that because man would come up with something religious, wouldn't he? Absolutely. So this word, the church, ecclesia, ecclesia, it would come from these disciples, these apostles, and those that would believe the message that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. So this church, this group, you, me, from the beginning of time, or actually, no, not from the beginning of time, I apologize, from 
Acts chapter 2 and on. Say amen if you're with me. When the church was born, the day of Pentecost. We don't have time to get into that. For those of you that are new, just follow along. Um, from, two, from Acts chapter 2 to the day of the rapture. This time between the 69th week of Daniel and the 70th week of Daniel, which we'll get into one of these days because we've planned on that for the new year. Here we have this church age. Romans through Philemon. Romans through Philemon. These guys, these apostles, they're the ones that are going to be responsible for initiating the, the Holy Spirit. Amen? Through these men are going to be responsible for bringing in, ushering in this new covenant, if you will. Now, listen, don't get confused. It's not the men. True or false? Absolutely not. It's not man, right? Is it man? No, it's God by the power of the Holy Spirit through men bringing about His will. So these men are the ones that are going to usher in this, um, this new covenant, if you will, this new way, if you will. The law being done away with, grace being that which draws us close to God. So again, this is what he says, so I will build my church. I will build my ecclesia. This group, I'm going to build this group. And this is what he's telling them. Last one, please, or the next one, please. So notice, please go back and we can keep that up there. So notice this verse 18. And I also say to you that you are Peter. And on this rock I will build my church. And the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. So notice, I will build this rock. I will build my church. And the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. So notice, I want to remind you. He brings us together. Right? I will build. So who is it that brings us together? He, through the power of the Spirit. Amen? Because He's not physically here anymore. Matter of fact, He's not going to be the one that's going to be there. He's going to be gone, but the Helper is going to come. The, the Holy Spirit. So He brings us together. I will build. Notice that this church, this group, made up of individuals, is going to be built on a firm foundation. No shifting sand, if you will. He says, on this rock I will build. On this rock I will build. Notice again, also, it belongs to Him. I will build what? My church. It's not a pastor's church. It's not a priest's church. It's not, it's on, it, this is my church. I set the parameters. I set the standards. It's His church. I love this part. It's a stronghold. It's a stronghold. Notice the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. So notice, not only will the church not die, in other words, it will complete its mission. Say amen if you're with me. Not only will the church not die because it's going to complete its mission, but those that belong to it they won't either. So not only will the church as a whole not die, but those that belong to the church, i.e. me, you, us, we're not going to die either. Now, I know, you know, and I know that we will all die physically one day. True or false? Matter of fact, we have to. If not, we can't be there. <laughs> right? And the Bible is very clear that it, is a, it has been appointed for man to die once and then the judgment. Right? The unbelievers will go to judgment in Revelation 20, the great white throne judgment. We, as believers, will go to the Bema seat judgment where we will receive our rewards for the deeds done in the body. Say amen if you're with me, family. Right? So yeah, there's going to be a death. Every man's going to die and every man's going to have a judgment. It just depends what judgment you're going to. But you're going to be judged. 
And so I love this because when we take a step back, man, there's a lot of pressure that can be relieved from us because it's his church. And I don't know about you, but I always shift things to me specifically because, you know, I'm my favorite person. (laughs) And you're laughing, but you're your favorite person as well, right? And so I always say, Lord, but what about you? So, so what, how, how, what about me, Lord? You know, like, and because sometimes in the past, I have put my, I put I'm undue pressure on myself, right? Which also um, stirs me, and here's some very transparency, to put undue pressure on other people, right? Because I kind of try to hold the very, I hold a high standard, right? I, li- I like things done a particular way. But it's not because I'm here trying to be a hotshot, like in my household, let's say, but because I hold myself to a very high standard. Same many of you with me, family. And bl- don't, b- trust me that that's not because um, I'm an idiot. Uh, I'm a dummy, I, and I know that I am. And, and I'll gladly say that. I gladly face that. But I hold a very high standard. And, and so oftentimes, you know, like I try to produce things in my own strength. This is what it manifests itself in, trying to produce things in my own strength. Not really taking a step back and saying, Lord, you're in control. You're going to handle business. Same many of you with me, family. Because at the end of the day, don't you know that he's going to accomplish his will? <laughs> Newsflash, he's going to accomplish his will. <laughs> Whether you're in it or not, his will is going to be accomplished. And so I'll struggle with certain things because my, my view is so myopic. I'm only looking at this right here. And I don't tend to look over here. And I don't tend to look over here. I just tend to look at Sunday. Oh my gosh. But there's still Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday coming. Amen? And he's still on the throne. Guess what? He's still going to be on the throne Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. And Thursday and Friday. And so again, when I take a step back and I realize, man, I'm yours. There's a willing heart here. This is not a rebellious heart. Pray for me because take heed lest you fall, true or false, in the drop of a dime. But here's a willing heart. So man, I put those things together and I say, Lord, I can just rest today. I have prayers that are unanswered. I have things that are not happening that I would like them to happen. They don't seem like they're even close to happening You know, um, I want my marriage to get better. I have a fantastic marriage. I want it to get better. I, I, I I know I need to grow and learn in a lot of ways, in a lot of things. Um, So on and so on and so on. And I tend to give, I tend to put a lot of pressure on myself. And man, I'm learning to say, look, this is all belongs to you. I'm a passenger. I'm passing through. And I need to rest more because at the end of the day, your will is going to be accomplished. You either believe Philippians 1, 6 or you don't. He who begun a good work, listen, he's going to finish it. So I'm confident that he's going to finish the work that he began in me. See, I'm thinking, get it all done today. And he's like, I can't get it all done today. There's still a lot of things that I need to, that because that, no magic wand is waved, true or false. Zero magic wand is waved. There's this long, drawn-out process that he has. That he, that, he f- that he fashions and he functions and he, and he allows cir- circumstances and he allows heartache and he allows letdowns and he allows our stupidity. <laughs> right? And, and, but he works through it and he navigates through it. And only God can do that. You and I would not be able to do that. You don't think he could have downloaded with, to these guys? Like, you know, the download, you know how you guys that are computer savvy, you know what a download means? That you just, brah, it comes. No, he, he's, he could have done that, but he's chosen not to do that. He has this long, drawn-out process, man, that we see throughout the ages. Corporately, as a, as a, as a, as a people, and, and individually as, as a person. And that's what I see. So it's good to take a step back, take a deep breath, stay, stay locked in. Amen? No, no, no need to, 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 
to phase out. No, stay locked in because he's going to do the work, man. And, and it's marvelous in our eyes. When it's all said and done, it's going to be like, wow, I can't believe this, what you have done. It's amazing, Lord. Amen? One more, please. Nope. Keep, no, no, we're good. we're good. Keep it like that. I was off as usual. So let's continue. So notice, because we're going to go through this again. We're breaking all this down. Stick with me here. And I also say to you, verse 18, Matthew 16, that you are Peter. And on this rock, I will build my church. So we talked about the church, who it belongs to, the strong foundation that, it, that it's, um, it's going to be on. The stronghold that it is. Amen. Side note. Um, the, the gates of Hades will not prevail against it. Right? It's the church. The corporate body. Uh, starting in Acts chapter 2. Ending on that last day that the, tri- that, that the rapture comes. Whether we're around or not. Um. It's going to accomplish its purposes. Amen? Right? Because the gates of Hades will not prevail against it. So it's going to accomplish its purpose. And by the way, it will not die. Right? Nothing can snatch it. Nothing can, can, can shift it as a whole. And, and the same with us, family. Our salvation is secure. Same man if you're with me. Right? Um, do we work out our salvation with fear and trembling? Absolutely, man. That's the, that's the, that's the exhortation for us. So I don't sit back. Man, I, I run towards the, the, the goal. I run towards the prize. Amen? Um, I run towards it. I fight the good fight of faith. Amen? Absolutely. Absolutely. But not to secure my salvation. Absolutely not. No, because my salvation is secure. Say amen if you're with me. I'm going to say that again. I don't, I, don't, I don't run towards the prize. Run towards the prize. I don't do that to secure my salvation. I don't fight the good fight of faith to secure my salvation. No, my salvation is secure. I do that because my salvation is secure. Because I'm there and I'm standing strong. So I lock in and I roll, man, by the power of the Spirit. Amen? So, man, we're secure. The stronghold, it's not going to be messed with. So notice, verse 18, And I also say to you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. And I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. So let's stop there and let's encamp there. And again, I can't, we can't sit here for seven hours. So I challenge you to do some more, you know, homework if you want. The first homework that I would tell you would be, Holy Spirit, speak to me and show me. That's the first thing that I would tell you. And dig into this, right? So I can't give you everything, everything, but I can give you what I believe that the Holy Spirit has given us for today. Based on what I sense in my heart through prayer, what he wants to show us. So, if you can look up here. So, let's talk about the keys to the kingdom. But right before we do, let's talk about, and on this rock, I will build my church. And and what rock is that? Right? Well, is it Peter? Is it he's the rock? No, absolutely not. Right? Same man, if you're with me. Right? The rock is never a man. Except the man, Christ Jesus. Right? Because there's only one mediator between God and man. And that is who? The man, Christ Jesus. And there is no other foundation that can be laid than that which has already been laid. Christ Jesus. Amen? So, it can't be Peter. Like some religions teach. Like some cults teach. It can't be, man. It can't be Peter. Because he's a man. And not even two months from now, he's going to straight up deny Christ. <laughs> That's the rock? No. By the way, not once, not twice, but three to thrice. Thank you, sir. He's not the rock. There's only one rock. Edward Abraham's not the rock. Tony's not the rock. 
Hernandez is the rock. Dwayne Johnson's not the rock. <laughs> Jesus is the rock. He's the one that can't be moved. He's the rock. The chief cornerstone, if you will. So let's get off this trip. Not that we're on it. That Peter was the rock. Okay? No, he's not. The rock is, listen, the proclamation that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. There is the rock. And on this rock, I'm going to build my church. For what is it that brings you and I together? The fact that you say and believe that Jesus is the, 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 the Christ, the Son of the living God. Amen? And before we jump into this, let me give you a little side note. I, I believe in my heart that we were that all of us have been we have been born from the beginning of time with this innate desire to gather. Man, meaning human beings, right? Has been born with this innate desire to gather. I see it all the time, man. I, I, I get up, I even thought about it this morning as I was driving, because you know I like to drive on Sunday mornings. I also have a prayer meeting some Sunday mornings with some pastors, but I, I usually, but I drive. I love to drive. So I get up on Sunday morning super early and I drive. And I pass by this particular Cuban place and there's always like a group of guys every single Sunday morning and they're hanging out there yapping away, right? And like, I don't know them. I don't know what they're planning afterwards, but but people have this innate desire to gather. That's why you have bicycle clubs, right? I used to cycle. And on the mornings, everybody would gather. And that's why you have this club and that club, and you have this and you have that, because we have this innate desire to gather. What happens during Thanksgiving? What happens during Christmas? You what? You gather. We have this innate desire, and I believe it was there by, by God. God. But we have, of course, since we don't all follow God, right? We it, it'll be shifted into different places, right? It'll be it, it'll be it'll be it, it'll be it'll be disguised with different with with different gatherings. But at the end of the day, the gathering was supposed to be the people who love God. Same so, if you with me. Amen. The awkward silence. I love it. And so listen, this rock that he's speaking about, on this rock I will build my church. It's the proclamation. It's the belief. Blessed are you, Simon Barjona. For flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who's in heaven. It's God. And it's this desire and it's this proclamation that we have. Because if a man believes in his heart and he confesses with his mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord, he shall be saved. And that is it. This is the, the gathering. That's the rock of this e e ecclesia, if you will. I'm here this morning. Why? Because Jesus Christ is the Messiah. He's the Son of God. And you believe the same thing. Amen? Amen. And so what about this keys to the kingdom? Well, let's talk about first two things only. What it isn't. Number one, Peter does not have the authority to admit or not admit people into heaven. Do you know that some people actually believe that? And you've heard it all the time, right? When you get to the gates, who's going to be there? Peter! What? That guy's a sinner like me. Are you kidding me? That guy denied you three times. I've only denied you once, the Lord. That guy three times. Why, does, why him? Right? Just a joke. But like when you really start weighing it, it's like, okay, well, no, no, what? So, no. No, the keys to the kingdom is not that, okay? Another one, Peter's not the first pope. Newsflash, there is no pope in the Bible. Another cult trying to stick doctrine, false theology down your throat. He's not the first pope. No such thing as that. That's the first pope. I think John, the, John would be better as the first pope. That guy was awesome. Peter? No. No such thing as the Pope. 
Again, not to insult anybody, if anybody's listening or whatever, even anybody here. No, there's, there's no such thing as a pope. So he's not the first pope. Listen, a possible answer. <coughs> this keys to the kingdom. And please don't come to me after service. Blur, blur, blur. I know, there's a hundred of them. I know they are. You think this is the first time I opened this thing up? No, I know. But as we look at the totality of the scriptures, I submit to you that this is probably one of the best answers. What is this keys to the kingdom? Well, I submit to you, based on the totality of what we see, the Holy Spirit, it guided him, Peter specifically, to open the doors of the kingdom to the Jews. Acts chapter 2, verses 38 and 39. And to the Gentiles. Acts chapter 10, verses 34 through 44. By sharing that Jesus is the same proclamation that he made, right? That Jesus is the Christ, the Messiah, the Son of God. Say amen if you're with me, family. Amen. So could it be that that's what Jesus means? Hey, I'm giving you the keys to the kingdom. You're the one that's going to get the opportunity to open up the doors initially to all of it, to, to the Jew and to the Gentile. Remember, there's only two nations to God. Jew and what? Gentile. That's it. And now the two have become what? One. Now it's only Christians. Say amen if you're with me, family. Amen. Right? So there are no other nations. There are no other group of people under God's uh, thought process, if you will. There's, either, there's only Jew and Gentile. And he is the one that opened up the doors for these two. Now, we know that Paul became the apostle to the Gentiles. That's very clear in the scriptures, right? Ordained by God, or better yet, elected by God to be the, 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 the apostle to the Gentiles. But it was Peter who opened up the door because in Acts chapter 10, Paul is still not doing anything. It's Peter. Acts chapter 10. So, could this be the keys to the kingdom? I submit to you, yes. Absolutely. Could it be more? Absolutely. And I want to remind you that it wasn't not only, but it, it wasn't only to him, it was to the other apostles as well. Amen? Amen. Right? Because the other apostles were going to go out and share the gospel as well and be part of of the, 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 the fabric, if you will, by the power of the Spirit to bring salvation or the message of salvation, if you will. By the way, one quick and side note, Peter's not the first pope. If anybody should have been the first pope or could have been the first pope, it would have been James. Because James was the leader of the early church. The Bible is very specific on that, not Peter. So anyway, side note. So next one, please. I remind you, why do I say that these keys to the kingdom could have been that, what we just spoke, spoke about in the prior slide? Well, look what the Bible very clearly tells us. And I'm, I jumped into Ephesians 2.20, but if you read 18 to 21, it kind of gives us a better picture. But I just got um, chapter, um, chapter 2, verse 20. It says, having been built, this group of believers this church on the foundation notice of the apostles and prophets Jesus Christ himself being the chief what cornerstone he's the rock amen, amen. right that proclamation about him which means him so notice notice who the church is built on it's on the foundation of the apostles and prophets who went out and shared the message they did too. You and I do today, amen? But, but the foundation was them. They started it in Acts chapter 2. Remember, the church didn't exist before Acts chapter 2, and it won't exist after the rapture. What we know as the church age, the group of believers, Holy Spirit group of believers that gather. Say amen if you're with me. Amen. What God calls the church. Will there be a group of believers gathering after the church age during the, the tribulation period? Of course, that's what Jude is about. That's what 1st, 2nd, 3rd John is about. That's what Hebrews is about. That's what 1st Peter and 2nd Peter is about. That's all for them. So, of course, but right now, this is where we're at. Romans 2, Philemon. Look at verse 21, 14. Now the wall of the city. 
this city that we're going to look at and walk into, it had 12 foundations. And on them, on these 12 foundations, were the name of the 12 apostles of the Lamb. Did you see that, family? So, are these guys the foundation? Absolutely, these apostles were. Revelation 21, 14. 21, 14 tells us. So, that last sentence there, the church is built upon the foundation of the apostles. That we can't get away from that. That is what it is. So this keys to the kingdom. I submit to you, could there be more? Absolutely. Matter of fact, I, have, I can sit here for another hour and a half telling you more. But side note. Side note. No, this is what it's talking about. Um, and who's that 12th apostle? Because we know that Judas, although he's here, he's, do, he's saying the same thing that they're saying. And he's part of that. We know that he is the son of perdition and won't be a part of that, right? So there is one apostle missing. We know. The, the age-old debate, was it Matthias or was it Paul, right? I'll leave you to figure that out. But if you want to know the right answer, it's Paul. Anyway, let's move on. The next one. So, what about bind and loose? And we'll end here. Because notice, you got your Bibles there? And also I say to you, verse 18, that you are Peter... And on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. Verse 19, and I will give you the keys to the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Again, you can come up with more, I'm sure. Well, what about this bind and loose? Well, let me just tell you, and I'm running out of time, and I apologize for that, so I'm going to try to make it quick. Um, these were administrative judicial terms. Remember how uh, ecclesia, I said to you, had no religious connotations at all? Oh no, these did, right? Bind is to prohibit, loose is to permit. Now stick with me here, don't, don't lose me now. Stick with me because this is important because this is when we're going to put it all together. You remember how I told you that these apostles, and actually we saw it, Ephesians 2.20, Revelation 21.14, that they were going to be the foundation of this church, if you will, right? These apostles of the Lamb, they were going to be the foundation. Well, notice he says to them, hey, I'm going to give you the right, if you will, to bind and to loose. Remember, because what has gone off, what, 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 what we have shut off on is that you have the power to bind Satan. Satan, I bind you in the name. I'm not sure that you see that anywhere. Newsflash, you don't see that anywhere. It's got nothing to do with that. Zero to do with that. We want to stay in context. We want to stay oh, Start binding everything, right? Uh, and, and start loosing everything, right? You know what I say to those of you that want to lose some mind? I know some people that are in a hospital. As a matter of fact, we have a young lady back there that works in a hospital. And there are many, many babies that are super sick. You that loose, come with me. I want to see you loose these babies. And I'm kind of mocking, but I'm not, and, but I am. You know, so let's stop with that nonsense of loosing and binding and that I loose you and nonsense these are administrative terms they're judicial terms and when we bring it into context we're looking and we're seeing man he is building the church and he's giving these guys the opportunity the responsibility listen to form the church to form the church by the power of the spirit amen because it's always by the power of the spirit it's not of man it's God because it's whose church his church Right? It's his church. You can paint the, your house any color you want. God chooses what he wants to paint, how he wants to paint. Amen? Amen? So it's his church. And so let me give you a quick, quick, quick example. Again, administrative terms, judicial terms. So the, the Jews had a law, right? That, that, um, that if... Uh, okay, so let's suppose... Uh, this is a heavy subject for me, but your dog dies in your house. 
right? Your dog dies in your house. You come to the religious leader and ask, is my house unclean? His response, yes. Because what? Something died in the house. My dog dies in my yard. Is my house unclean? No, it's not. Right? Loosed. Permitted. Amen? Amen. No ritual, if you will. Remember, these are administrative terms. The dog dies on your porch. I know that you're going to think this is funny, but like literally, this is the goofiness that, this would, that they would go through. But these are what these terms are talking about. So we can't confuse them and start me telling you, go by Satan. No, listen, run from Satan is my exhortation to you. By the power of the Spirit, you and I don't have the power unless he, he is in us to deal with any of the nonsense that is thrown our way. And even then, you better bow your knee and you better pray because you and I are simply not strong enough. But he is in us. Amen? Amen. So let's not forget that. So the dog dies. I mean, this is the, the extent of the goofiness, but I'm trying to make a point of what this bind and loose means. And the dog's nose is facing the house. Like, serious. Like if you look at these readings, which I used to get enthralled in this, but now I tell you, read this or not? No! no! Don't waste any time with any of this nonsense. Read Romans through Philemon. And if you want to add the Gospels, yes. And if you want to add first bit, yes, absolutely. Don't get caught up with nonsense. Well, it's not nonsense. Just don't get caught up with this. Just read what, what's here. This is the most important thing. This is what's giving you life. Nothing else. And so, but, but I know this because I used to be in, I, I used to read all this. The nose of the, the dog is facing the house. So you would come to the religious leader, is my house clean or not? He would say, bound. It's unclean. If the nose was facing the other way, loosed. Are you following me? I know it's kind of funny, but these are the judicial terms that were used, right? Bound and loosed. It wasn't about Satan. It wasn't about the girl who has cancer. Oh, I loose you nothing to do with that nonsense we wish it was like that because then what how many people could we free from their um, malady true or false true. right one of the sisters has an issue right now I could have loosed it this morning but I didn't why newsflash I can't only God can amen? amen and so this is what this is about so when he tells them there again in context in context Hey, Peter, verse 8, 19, and I will give you the keys to the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. In other words, you guys are going to set the parameters. I'm using you guys by the power of the Spirit, because we want things on earth as they are in, Amen. right? So it's not, loose this, and I bind you. No, no, no. It's, hey, man. We're going to get a group of people. And they, by the power of the Spirit, they're going to live their lives. They're going, to, they're, they're going to have parameters around them that they're going to live their lives on earth as if it was in heaven. Amen? Amen? And you guys are the ones that are going to bring this about. It's you guys that are going to bring this. The Holy Spirit through you. It's not going to be through Edward Abraham. It's not going to be through Marty. It's not going to be through Monica. No, it's going to be through you guys. You guys are going to be the foundation. Who wrote the Bible? Who wrote the New Testament? <laughs> These guys. Are you putting it all together, family? And this is what it's talking about. I only got two head nods. Okay, so the, so the, the two of you that got it, praise the Lord. Right? So this is what it's talking about. Amen? Amen. All right. Praise the Lord. No bells and whistles today, man. Just straight up doctrine. Let's pray. Father, we thank you again for this beautiful day, Lord. We are reminded, Lord, that your word, it's a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path, Lord. Even when it is devoid of all the bells, of, devoid of bells and whistles outwardly, Lord, 
there's explosions happening in our hearts, Lord. And that's what we rejoice in, Lord. For we know that this earthly tent, it's passing away, Lord. But that inner man, Father, it is growing and maturing by the moment, Lord. As a result of your word and the truth of your word, Lord. So we're grateful, Daddy, again, that we are part of a church, Lord. Um, that this ecclesia, if you will, Lord, not because of this man, Lord, but because of these, your people, um, is serious about that which you have for us, um, Lord, for the purposes that you are working out in and through us in our lives, Lord. You being the master craftsman, Lord, you being the potter, Lord, continues to mold and shape this clay individually and collectively, Lord, for your will and purpose, Father. Thank you, Lord, that by the power of your spirit, you've given us the opportunity to say yes. And so, Lord, again, we run towards the prize, Lord, not growing slack, not growing, um, Lord, with apathy. Um, Lord, continuing to fight the good fight of faith, that we would face you on that day and be told, well done, my good and faithful servant. All praise, all honor, all glory belongs to you who reigns on high. Thank you, Father. In Jesus' name we pray and all of God's people said, Amen. Amen. And Amen. Praise the Lord. Thank you for your